Welcome back. Uh, we are so excited this week to have Dr. Nancy Bull Penrod with us. And uh, Dr. Bull Penrod is a psychotherapist uh, and trainer to first responders. And so this is going to be one of the uh, first weeks we actually dedicated the whole week to heroes. Uh, here at Amon Clinics, we did the world's first and largest study on active and retired NFL players. And I realized they're not really heroes, they're entertainers, that the real heroes in our society are firefighters and police officers and uh, paramedics and the people who respond when you need them. Uh, so I'm very excited to have Dr. Bull Penrod with us. Um, so she's got a PhD in clinical psychology. She's the founder and director of the Counseling Team International, also known as the Southern California Critical Incident Stress Management Team, uh, which has taught over 12,000 first responders throughout the U.S. and Canada. She's the past president of the International Association of Police Chiefs Psychological Service Section, Vice President of the National Sheriff's Association Psychological Service Section. I could go on and on. But welcome, Nancy. Tell us about how you got interested in helping first responders. Okay, and, and thank you very much, Doctor, for having me um, on. I um, first got interested because I married a police officer and I watched how some of the incidents that he experienced impacted him and how he found himself uh, withdrawing, um, drinking too much alcohol, um, not really um, being engaged in a social life. And when that occurred, um, he had a critical incident, which was a car accident that ended up um, forcing him to retire early uh, at a, a young age. When he retired, I watched how his police department did absolutely nothing for him. They didn't do anything for me, our family. They actually said, hey, you know, it was great having you around as long as you were and sent him on his way. And he was not prepared for that. None of us were prepared for that. So I was like, what do you mean they're just saying goodbye? I mean, in our minds, we thought that he would be a police officer for 30, 35 years, put in his retirement, and life would go on. When that didn't happen, um, and uh, it became very difficult, our marriage became really difficult, um, I went to his police department and said, I'm getting my degree in um, psycho, in um education, um, counseling, I would like to help out your officers when they're involved in a critical incident. And the chief at the time, I actually call him my bullet in the back chief. He said, uh, you know what? I have a bullet in my back from a shooting years ago. Uh, I didn't need to talk to anybody because my family didn't need me help. And so I said, well, it's a little different now. He goes, no, Cops don't need help. So he sent me out the door. So I was a little frustrated, but my personality is I'm not going to let that, you know, push me down. I'm going to still try to help law enforcement. So I went to the local sheriff's department and it took me quite a while to get an appointment, but I did get an appointment with um, a lieutenant um, at the sheriff's department. He's, he's retired now. His name's um, Jim Nunn and said, finally got an appointment with him and said, look, you need to do something for your deputies when something bad happens to them. And he listened and said, let me take this to the sheriff. And he took it to the sheriff at the time, who was a cowboy, somebody who didn't um, really um, believe in counseling or any kind of therapy. And he sat there for a while and he said, you know what? My son was in a shooting. He got divorced. He turned to drugs. He turned to alcohol. He became angry and he said, I had to fire him and I was the sheriff. And I'll tell you what, he said, I think you have something there. I did nothing for him. And that's how I started. 
I did an internship. I did, I went back to FBI Academy at Quantico several times to learn about law enforcement and what the FBI was doing. And then as soon as I got licensed, I opened up a private practice and started going out to all the fire and police departments saying, I want to help, I want to help, because I didn't want another family to go through what I went through. And I didn't want um, cops and firefighters and police officers and and um, deputy sheriffs to be out there without any support. And that's how it happened. Wow. That's really a great story. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned? And over the next three podcasts, we'll unwrap those. Um, but I, I want to preview some for the people listening. Um, psychological and emotional trauma is so rampant in our society. But it's almost part of the job when I think of the firefighters that I have seen. I've actually not met any firefighters that have not experienced some pretty horrific events. Um, so when, when you just think over uh, the time you've been helping first responders, what, what are the top three or four big lessons you've learned? I've learned that they mask and they don't share readily, that you have to build a rapport with them and that because of what they're trained, uh, what, what they're given at the academy, they're actually trained to stuff it to push it down. Don't let it bother you. You know, get over it as quickly as you can because you're going to go on another call that they, that they, um, because of that, it's not an easy uh, position to just walk in and think that you're going to build an instant rapport with them and have them share their life story with you. So you have to, as a clinician, you have to take your time, but as for departments, just based on the story I just told you about, um, what happened to me personally in my family is that it, there's a trickle down theory, definitely, meaning if a police chief, a fire chief, a fire battalion chief, a captain on a department, they don't believe in the helping process. Um, they, they let everybody know that. So everyone's afraid to ask for the help. You know, they don't reach out um, because their um, commanders are telling them that it's not a good thing. Um, I think the third thing is that they are such kind people that so many of the incidents that they work on a daily basis impact them. And it, it not just, not just them emotionally, but it impacts um, their family life. It impacts the way they view the world. Um, some of it, negative, um, but also some of it's positive. You know, they also know how to enjoy life. And um, the fourth thing is that they are very family oriented and they so often push the family aside, even though that they love their families, they push them aside because of the job. The job demands their time, their energy, and um, it zaps them of some of their joy and so they push their families aside and, and they don't know they're really doing it. So let's take a step back and just talk about many of them are kind. So they're in a service profession. They chose to be in a service profession. But, but I think that that might not be a word people would associate with police officers or um firefighters. Um, so say more about that. I, I always, when, when I talk to them, I tell them that they picked the job. The job didn't pick them. And the fact that they picked the job, what that means is their personalities are a lot alike. They're rescuers. Um, many of them come from a background where they rescued, whether they were rescuing an alcoholic father from hurting their mothers, or they were rescuing the, the kid that was bullied at school, um, or the female that didn't have, you know, um, good parents. They're rescuers from early on. They, they're rescuers. 
And so out of that personality that chooses the job is their kindness. They truly have a calling. And they, and they many of them, if you ask them um, when they're getting hired, why do you want to do this? And, and I don't think that it's just something that they want. They just say. I believe they really feel it. They say they want to make a difference. They, um, they want to stop crime. They actually want to be able to physically and emotionally help people. Um, you'll hear firefighters say, um, I met a firefighter when I was five years old who rescued my cat, and I wanted to, to do that because I know how much joy it brought me. I mean, they really are kind um, people. I see the, the, the very best in them, and I get an opportunity to experience the, the best of them. It's wonderful. When we come back, we're going to talk about first responders and some of their common mental health struggles. Stay with us. Welcome back. I am here with Dr. Nancy Bull Penrod, and we're talking about first responders. Uh, you know, our podcast is called The Brain Warrior's Way Podcast because we believe you're in a war for the health of your brain everywhere you go. Someone is trying to shove bad food down your throat that will kill you early. Um, we often joke the weapons of mass destruction are highly processed, pesticide sprayed, high glycemic, low fiber, food-like substances stored in plastic containers. And it's not just the food, it's air pollution, it's water pollution, it's gadget pollution. And uh, I was uh, in the Army for 10 years. I was an infantry medic, uh, so in a sense, I was a first responder. I uh, actually drove an ambulance for a while. And then later, an x-ray technician where I learned to fall in love with looking at the brain and then as, as a psychiatrist. And, and so I can relate to kind and wanting to help. Uh, but after a while, people can get compassion fatigue. And, you know, as a therapist, you certainly can get that, especially if you're dealing with a lot of trauma situations. But let's talk about some of the common problems you have seen, the common mental health problems you've seen in first responders. Some of the mental health problems, I mean, you, you, you mentioned nutrition, you know, their, their diet is awful. You know, they don't, they eat fast food. They, um, you know, if you ever take a picture of a, of a trash can outside a jail, um, it's unbelievable where they've been eating on their break. I mean, it's fast food. So you're right about the nutrition. But emotionally, I think that they um, they get um, blunted. Their affect can get real blunted. And they, um, they experience levels of depression. They don't call it depression, you know, because if you say to them, you know, I think you might be suffering from depression. It's like, I'm not depressed. I'm not depressed. But um, I think depression at, at a low level, you know, a mild depression um, does, does uh, I think it's pervasive throughout um, their entire world because they deal with so much bad stuff over and over again. Uh, right now, I think the times that, are, um, that we have in our country that are not supporting law enforcement and um, the attacks, the the active shooter events and the things that are done by city councils and, and unfortunately some, some rules that are made and laws that are passed that aren't supportive of law enforcement um, impacts them. I think that has also had, has played a huge part in their depression. You, you meet them and it's almost like they went from idealism. I'm going to save the world. I'm going to help. I'm going to help. I'm going to help. And it moves it into realism, which is they're prevented from doing so much of that because of everything else um, going on. I, um, 
I experience with them a lot, sometimes anger. They become a little more short fused and the short fusedness is I think packing in the trauma, you know, and not dealing with it. They, um, they're, uh, told different things about, uh, why we need them as a country when, um, you know, they went into it believing that everyone supported them. And now people say, no, you know, we don't support you like you, like you think we do. And so I think that that level of anger surfaces in um, some use of force incidents. Our firefighters are short fused. You know, they, you see that how they, um, sometimes overreact to things when they never acted like that before. Families will tell us he never acted like that before, or she's never been like that before. And now they're on the job like 10, 15 years and that's um, affecting them. So I think, I think anger and uh, sleep, sleep deprivations, huge. You know, um, I was teaching this morning, 35 peer supporters, fire and police, and I asked them, how many of you get a, how many of you get a good night's sleep and put, raise your hand? Not one hand went up. Wow. Then I asked them, how many of you believe that you spend enough time with your families? Not one hand went up. That's, that's an example. They're tired. They're exhausted um, because they don't uh, have enough people to, to uh, work the um, positions that the departments need people to work in. A firefighter told me yesterday that he's on mandatory um, seven days a week. Now imagine um, seven days a week being away from your family, but also um, having to go to work when you're missing all the things with your family and the exhaustion of getting up, you know, the bell rings, the alarm goes off. They're um, in the um, midst of an event immediately. And then they try to go back to sleep and they can't so sleep deprivation. I think is huge too. So right after 9-11, I got hired by the NSA to look at the brain health of their employees and going to um, the NSA building, the big building in Maryland where they take away your phone. And I was really interesting. But as I talked to them, um, I became very disturbed because they were working such long hours that I knew they were going to make mistakes. Because if the brain doesn't sleep seven hours at night, it can't clean itself. So that's what happens when you sleep. The brain cleans or washes itself. And if you don't sleep enough, trash builds up, and then you start making really bad decisions. And so when they asked for my report, I'm like, you know, you probably don't really want to see this, but unless you get these people to sleep more, they're going to continue to make mistakes, which is going to cause more national security incidences. And, um, you know, firefighters and first responders often are working so much they're not sleeping, which then leads to mistakes. And the mistakes then lead to self-recrimination and a serious um, hit on their sense of self because they see themselves initially as competent people and they like that. And when they're less competent because their brain health habits, their nutrition and sleep... Um, or hurt, it really hurts their ability to be effective. Absolutely. And, you know, they also turn to uh, alcohol a lot. You know, you will have um, a lot of um, substance use disorders actually with them because they um, turn to alcohol. They feel like that's the, the answer to some of their uh, incidents and that that becomes their coping skill. So um, you'll find a lot of them that um, have problems with um, alcohol. What percentage do you think have ADD of one form or another? Um, you know, I often say there's people who run away from fires. It's like, oh, that's hot. And then there are people who run toward fires. And they react before they have a chance 
to have their frontal lobes kick in and go, you could be hurt. So when I was an infantry medic, um, I didn't really like it because people were shooting at me. And I just never really got used to that. Um, plus I didn't like sleeping in the mud. But but I'm not a person who runs toward a fire. I'm more like, oh, it's hot, you know, somebody should go in there. Um, but our ADD population, they sort of like that, you know, they jump out of airplanes, they go toward excitement seeking situations as opposed to away from it. So is that, Nancy, anything you've thought of? You know, I, um, I've thought of it, but not the way you put it, but I, I usually call it like the, they're adrenaline junkies. <laughs> you know, right. they, they need that adrenaline high because um, if, if, if somebody gets in trouble, if they, if they are disciplined, if they've done something wrong and you look back in their history, you will find a lot of high risk behaviors that, that took place with that person prior to being, um, you know, hired. And then during um, the time that they work. And, and I think you're right. They just, they, they love that adrenaline. They love everything about that feeling of getting involved in the middle of, of something and, High, high energy, high, high energy. I never really put it in the terms of ADD, but I think you're, you're absolutely right. High, high percentage. When we come back, we're going to talk about more of mental health struggles, particularly understanding some of the psychological and emotional reactions to trauma. Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, we're having this great discussion with uh, Dr. Nancy Bull Penrod, psychologist and expert uh, in serving the first responder community. And Nancy, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is I just I have this huge heart for um, not only veterans but first responders. I was a veteran and as an infantry medic, a first responder. Um, and as we've looked at their brains here over the last 30 years, um, I see three patterns. I see um, emotional trauma, because almost all of them have it when you talk to them about their histories, if they've been on the job for any length of time. Um, we see their emotional brain stirred up, which may be why they drink more, because they want to calm it down. Um, I see toxic exposure, not so much in the police officers, but definitely in the firefighters, uh, you know, inhaling carbon monoxide, cyanide from burning furniture. Um, their brains do not look healthy overall. It looks like they're being poisoned. And then physical trauma to the brain, and that could be the falls that they've had um, during their career. And so emotional trauma, physical trauma, toxicity, which all by itself is going to give you issues with depression, PTSD, um, anxiety, panic, and and when a masculine driven, I don't want to say macho, but I sort of do, because that's clearly in the veteran uh, group that, that I served with and that I've treated, um, is they don't like to say I'm sad. Um, and it comes out more of them being, as you said, short-tempered, irritable, um, and depression in guys is very different than depression in girls, because a girl say, I'm sad, and cry, uh, a boy or a man will often say, I'm not depressed, but they're really irritable and negative. I agree. Are 
first responder departments even thinking about toxic exposure? Oh, boy. Um, I, I, I think they are more so now than they did before. And I, I actually, I mean, this is just my take on it. But um, when the, um, now when you're t- talking about toxicity, you're talking about hazmat material, stuff like that. Is that what it is? Yes, but even just normal um, okay. fighting a fire that the carbon monoxide and the poisons released. And yes, they have masks on while they're fighting the fire, but as soon as they're done, they take it off. And the particulate matter in the air is still very high and still very toxic to them. And unfortunately, in New York City, we're seeing the fallout what were 18 years later of 9-11 and the elevated incidence of mental health challenges and physical challenges is just rampant among first responders. I, I think um, 9-11 has changed some things regarding that. And um, I do know that um, I went to 9-11 with six FBI agents and I, I was in Manhattan, but I didn't go down to the digging site at the building, but I was in Manhattan that had a lot of um, debris and, and, and smoke. And they stayed there. I was there for about a week. I had left the Pentagon, came back to California. They stayed there. Well, we now have three that have died from lung disease one from brain cancer, and they did attribute it to 9-11. Now, one of the things I found out about that was this. They had their cars. So the FBI gave them a car. They stayed, and one of them used that car for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And inside the car was everything you're talking about, in the seats, in the console, Everything from 9-11, from the air, was in the, the car. And when they started looking and testing what they were expecting the firefighters to still use, their equipment, their, their um, clothing, all of that, somebody said, wow, maybe this is what's causing some of the problems is because we're expecting them to be exposed to these chemicals over and over and over again. And we've never looked at how it impacts them. I have a fire department who made a decision that they would not sleep with their turnout gear right next to their bed because they would work a fire, come back, put their turnout gear, work a fire, come back, put their turnout gear. And they realized that's right next to them sleeping the whole time while they were sleeping with that next to them that it was impacting them. So they now spray their turnout gear and put it away and they don't have it right next to their bed. So I think you're absolutely correct on um, the new awareness. So I think it's getting better is my, is, is my thoughts. Well, and the first way to deal with it is to decrease exposure. So to teach them to keep their equipment on longer so they're not breathing in that particulate matter. Um, I love that they don't keep their soiled uh, equipment next to them and, and then support the four organs of detoxification. So kidneys drink more water, uh, gut eat more fiber, um, liver kill the alcohol because alcohol decreases your liver's ability to do its job of detoxifying the body and then sweat more with exercise and taking saunas and that's it's not hard you just have to set aside the time to do that on a regular basis but dealing with the physical toxins is just it's it's just crucial um do you have a great story uh, from your practice that you can share of uh, someone who's had a mental health issue um, and how you've helped them? 
I mean, I have a lot of them, but probably when, when you said that, the one that came to mind the most to me um, is somebody that uh, wanted to uh, quit the job, uh, wanted to get to get divorced, um, was totally um, overdoing the drinking and actually didn't want to live any longer. And the reason why I smiled when you said that was because um, he was, he had given up and about two weeks ago, he actually um, reached out to me and said um, there was a um, incident that occurred. He was telling me about how, how he handled it. And he said, and I just want you to know I'm getting ready to retire. And he um, said that he had spent 31 years and that he was still sober, um, still with his wife and family. And he wanted me to know because he was getting ready to retire that, that he felt I had played a part in it. And I mean, I know I played a part in it, but he's the one that had to make all the changes. <laughs> you know, and, well... Right. But it makes us feel good that we matter. Right. I mean, that's why they go into their job to be first responders, because they want to matter. And I think those of us that are therapists and physicians and helpers, um, you know, it serves we're we're happy when we are purposeful. And it's not true for everybody, uh, but it's certainly true for the temperaments that serve other people. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about EMDR and how EMDR can help first responders overcome trauma. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Nancy Bull Penrod. We're having this really fascinating discussion about first responders. And Nancy, you actually help uh, organize uh, an organization dedicated to psychological health for first responders. Can you talk about that? I'm um, sure, um, Dr. Amen, there is um, a group, it's a nonprofit, and it's called the Public Safety Peer Support Association. It, um, the board is made up of um, Anaheim Police Department, um, Probation Department, there's San Bernardino Sheriff's Department, Hawthorne, Orange County Fire Authority, LA County um, Fire Department. There's um, a whole group of board members 
and um, they run this this nonprofit, which provides um, peer support training to public safety individuals throughout the entire uh, world. world. And they have a conference every October or November, it depends on which month, um, in San Diego. And they are having their fourth um, in, um, annual conference coming up in November. They sold out last year. There were 660 people there. And they, uh, everyone there is a peer supporter for their department. Peer support is where um, we go in, the Counseling Team International, and we teach law enforcement, fire, dispatch, um, ER nurses. We, what we do is we teach them to help each other on if a fellow coworker is circling the drain, what do you do for them? Do you, um, what do you say? How do you get them the help? How are you the conduit to extra resources? And so we teach them what to look for, how to recognize someone who's depressed. And so they help each other out every single day. It is absolutely fabulous to see how they help their brothers and sisters in, in their profession all the time. They all come together to this conference and get extra training. They get to learn about subjects like EMDR, um, uh, your vitamins, which, which um, is fab are fabulous, by the way. Thank you. Um, so they get to um, get everybody to um, learn about all the extra things that maybe the clinical side um, of the house do, but they get to express and explain it to the person and then get them into extra help. And it has been absolutely phenomenal. Public Safety Peer Support Association org is a um, organization that is you know, the membership is fifty dollars a year, and um, you get some some information from that. But you get to go to the conference, and the speakers at the conference are fabulous. We have had military speakers from Benghazi. An individual came in. We've had Kevin Gilmartin, who talks about emotional survival and law enforcement. We've had Ben Vernon, who is a firefighter that suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, and he got EMDR, and he talks about his journey. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and it's just a fabulous organization, and I, and I think that they've changed a lot of lives and saved a lot of lives. That's great. So you mentioned EMDR. How did you first get interested in it? And how do you use it in your practice? It's something Tana and I talked a lot about on the podcast. When I first met her, I just adored her, and but also listened to the fact that she grew up in a home full of drugs, alcohol, and emotional trauma. And so one of my first gifts to her was 10 sessions of EMDR. And it's like, it's a weird gift if you're just starting to date someone. But I saw how awesome she was. And I'm like, this will help you. And it helped her in just such a positive, dramatic way. Um, uh, how I got involved is actually through the FBI. I went back to the FBI Academy at Quantico to teach peer support um, for a week. And, um, it was in, it was 1991. And this, uh, individual named Dr. Roger Solomon said, he came in and he said, I'm going to talk to everybody about this new technique I've learned. And, um, Dr. Roger Solomon is a police psychologist. And so I listened to him and I said, I haven't heard that much about it. And he said, you've got to get the training. So I went to, um, Francine Shapiro and had the training um, done by her. And then just, I went back actually and got the training from her a second time. And I started to use it with um, not as much of a critical incident, traumatic event for people. I was doing it for people that were um, that, um, infidelity issues or somebody who felt betrayed by a friend and then I um, went to more training and then looped it back around and started using it with um, law enforcement and fire service and the federal agents. And I'll tell you what, it still just is amazing to me on how it works. The, 
the great thing about it is they're being exposed more to the subject and they're more willing. And our my firefighters and police officers uh, will call and say, hey, um, I need to come in and get that eye thing done. <laughs> and I always kind of laugh and say, okay, it's EMDR. I have them read an article. I have them watch a video. And then I talk to them about it. And they absolutely are true believers when they, when they, when they leave, they truly are the spokes pe- people for it. They go out there and tell everybody, you need to call and get that done. You keep talking about that shooting. You haven't gotten over that traffic accident, that structure fire that you worked, you know, you need to go get EMDR. And so that's how I got involved. And I'll tell you what, I think it's one of the best things available for people that are involved in traumatic events. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, Actually, Francine Shapiro, who developed EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement, Desensitization and Reprocessing, she and I were friends and we did a study on police officers involved in shootings who all were off work. They all ended up going back to work uh, after an average of eight sessions. And recently there was an article that came out on why it works that when you get moving your eyes left to right or right to left and you you do it for 30 seconds, it quiets down the amygdala, which is the anxiety fear center deep in the brain, and it activates your frontal lobes. So the anxiety goes down, the thoughtful brain goes up, And it just begins to take away the emotional charge of what basically got stuck in the brain. And you're you're right. It is just so powerful. Do you have a story? Because we find people remember stories way more than um, just information. Do you have a story about how EMDR help someone. Although I loved what you said. It's like, oh, you're talking about that thing over and over again. You need EMDR to help get it out of your head. Right. You know, I do have, I do have an, an, an awesome story. Um, it, it was a um, firefighter and the firefighter was um, involved in an off-duty incident. And what happened was he was driving down the street and he hit and, and killed a rollerblader. And when the roll, when he hit the rollerblader, the rollerblader flew into his windshield. He knew not to slam on the brakes because the person would roll off. So he had to slow down and he had to go about 200 feet with him in his windshield. So he got out, tried to do first aid. And of course the person didn't survive. So he, his uh, department called me about four days later and said, he won't leave his house. He won't go to work. He's, he won't drive. His, his wife said that he's been stuck in the house. He won't get into a car. So I was, I, my first thought, of course, was, well, it's too bad you didn't have us come out earlier, but that's okay. And um, so they brought him in to my office. I met him on a Sunday at my office. And when I got here, his, his, um, captain's trying to tell me everything. And I said, okay. So I, um, I worked with him with EMDR. It it was about three hours, three and a half hours. And when we were done, he walked out into uh, my waiting room and he looked at his uh, captain and said, Hey, give me the keys. I'm driving back. And the captain was like, what, what did you do? And I said, look, it's, it's not me. It's the process. And it's what, and what it, it's, it's the hard work that he just put in to the process. And he was like, I don't believe it. And, and that person went on the road talking everywhere he went, he'd go, Oh, EMDR, EMDR. You can't believe what happened to me in EMDR. So that's one of my stories. Oh no, you're the miracle worker. When you have a story like that, people people don't forget it. Well, you've just just a joy to talk with uh, Dr. Nancy Bull Penrod. Um, uh, you know, write down what you've learned from this week. What's what's the one thing that 
our Brain Warrior community has learned from this session with Dr. Bull Penrod and um, post it, you know, and hashtag Brain Warriors Way podcast. Um, Nancy, where do you want them to go to learn more about you and your work? Okay, um, we have, uh, well, we have a website. It's the Counseling Team International. Um, dot com. And uh, we also, I mean, we have a 1-800 number, 1-800-222-991, um, to, if anybody needs to reach out to us. But on our website, we talk about peer support. If people want to develop a peer support program, um, we have all the information on, on how you develop it, how you get it started for your department. We also have a wonderful list of clinicians that we believe work with first responders that um, we can refer them to as a, as a resource. And we also have an app. And um, the app is called Public Safety Peer Support slash Supervisor Coach. And in the app is tons of information on how to talk to people, what to do if you are a um, peer supporter, or if you're not, or you're talking to someone who needs help, it uh, walks you through. It has tons of books in there, resources. Um, if you see a book that you like, you can hit the app and it goes straight to Amazon. You can order it. It um, covers tons of articles, newspaper articles, magazines, um, information written by all types of people that could help um, anybody that um, wants to reach out that's a first responder. Great. Well, reach out and learn more about uh, Nancy's work. We're so grateful to have you on the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Thank you. I'm grateful for being on it. Thank you very much. And, you know, as they said at the end of um, Schindler's List and what was written inside the ring, that when they gave the gold filling and made a ring for him, they said, you know, you save one life, you save eternity. So I've always believed that. I love that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amen Clinics, or trying some of the brain healthy supplements from BrainMD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855-978-1363.